This is episode number 552 of the Inner Fight Podcast with Kep Izard. Welcome back to another edition of the show, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Thanks also to our show sponsors, Smith Street Paleo. As we have been saying over the last few shows, you can still avail a very special summer offer with these guys. Drop them an email, hello at smithstreetpaleo.com. Three, four, five of you and your friends sign up for a meal plan and you will all get a super nice discount. So please do that. Hop over to smithstreetpaleo.com to see exactly what's going on. And if you want to take advantage of that offer, hello at smithstreetpaleo.com is where you need to be sending your email. Welcome back to another edition of the show, folks. And as many of you know, yes, I'm down in Australia, so why not connect with different people down here? It makes it a lot easier for recording on the different, on the same timelines rather than different timelines. Yeah, that's one thing you didn't think about, isn't it? When we're putting these shows together, All the guests that we get from different parts of the world aligning time zones, but we're actually on the same time zone as our guest today. Our guest is a gentleman called Kep Izzard, who I actually connected with on Instagram a while back now and just found what he was doing super interesting. No, he doesn't have thousands of Instagram followers. That's not why we got him on the show, but he has an incredible story. And he also has some really cool things, which hopefully in today's show pretty sure he will, share them with me and also with you guys. He's done incredible things. He got into triathlon. Yes, another triathlete, but he got into triathlon a little bit later, having had quite a, what we could say is quite a lot of exposure to sport as a youngster. And then as you'll see, He is actually an incredible triathlete. He's been once already to Kona, the World Championships for the long course for Ironman in 2017. He's going again in 2019. He won his age group in Ironman Taiwan last year through an incredible adversity, which I hope he shares on the show. And he claims to have a certain superpower. Hopefully, you guys enjoy enjoy this show. Let's jump into it. Welcome back to another edition of the show, folks. And as I was saying there, I am super excited about today's guest because he has a superpower that we're going to get into a little bit later. But before we do that, Kep Izzard, we're in Australia. Mate, thank you so much for taking the time to chat to me. Mr. Marcus Smith, it's uh, it's, it's an honor to be uh, to having a chat with you, mate. I'm, uh, I'm a big fan. <laughs> mate, not at all. We're a big fan of you, mate. You've got some incredible achievements to your name and that superpower that we're going to come to later. But, mate, <laughs> let's, let's start at the start, mate. Give us a bit of a background. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? And importantly, which I really like to get into is what was... What's your first experience of sport? Because you've become quite an accomplished sportsman. So give us your background, mate, and let's roll from there. Yeah, no worries. But I, I grew up on the sunny coast. Um, grew up playing soccer and, and also surfing. You sort of can't live down there with either, without <laughs> surfing or surf lifesaving or, you know, most people end up on the beach in some form or another. Yeah. So as a junior or, or a younger player, I was okay. I was no no rock star at anything really. Um, I made a few representative teams playing soccer and, and futsal or, in, or indoor soccer, five a side indoor soccer. Um, but the surfing was just for really just for shits and giggles to get out there with your mates and and have a good old time. So that that sort of was my introduction to sport. Um, I think I started playing when I was about six. Um, right. Progressed into other sports as well. I, there's not much I haven't played. I played volleyball, basketball, touch football. Wow. Oh God, the list is endless of what I've tried. <laughs> do you think? Do you think that's something like in England we play a lot of sport, mate? But do you think the climate out here lends itself to people playing a lot of sport? I mean, it seems super active, a like super active lifestyle, especially Sunshine Coast. Like, absolutely, you, yeah. you can't help but get outside I, yeah. and. And since growing up and, and going back there now, when I'm, I'm still down there fairly regularly. I was down there last weekend, but yeah. they promote that as well by putting in really good facilities for people, whether it's you wanting to swim or ride or run or, or play team sports. There's there's some something everywhere. I was in a small little town in the middle of nowhere 
northwest of Noosa on the weekend. Right. And you're riding through. I was riding through the town, and there's still a football field in the middle of the town. Like, <laughs> there's a shop and a football field. So. <laughs> it's almost like you, that's they're the elements of building a decent town, right? Very important. You got to be able to get a pie, get a beer. And play footy, <laughs> eh? <laughs> yeah. Well, mate, I think that's uh, yeah. Where well, Holly's from, uh, you've got uh, it, it, it's a it's a country town, but the bakery is definitely one of the uh, sort of one of the central points of the town. <laughs> so <laughs> very good point. Yes. Yeah. You can't go through most towns without a bakery. Yeah. Exactly. So, mate, that was it. Really, life was life was a lot about sport then. Growing up, I guess. Yeah. I. I guess sort of I, I I guess I've spent five or six days or, or some days seven seven days a week playing playing sport of some description whether it was through school or or through club stuff. Um, my old man was a good good soccer player uh, years ago um, back in back in good old Mother England where he was from and my mum was a reasonable swimmer. Right. Um, so look, I guess the genes for sport are there. Um, I probably prioritised the sport more than I should have and probably should have prioritized a bit of the, the schooling and the academics a little bit more when I look back, but hey, I'm what, not complaining. What were, what were you like at school, mate? Give us a bit of chat about that because I always uh, find that interesting. I, I was I was the 80% person, um, uh, as I mentioned to you earlier. Um, I could sort of pick most things up pretty quickly. Um, I would get up at sort of 4.30, 5 o'clock each morning and ride my push bike to the beach, go surfing, and ride my bike to school and then um, would promptly then usually fall asleep generally in maths or English. So, <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that sounds, um, sounds a bit like what I was like as well, I think, mate. It was never, so... never seemed to fall asleep in PE. So never, yeah. never, never in the PE <laughs> classes did I ever fall asleep. So I don't know how that happened. <laughs> so sport was something that, that, that was, I mean, seems like, mate, from an early age, something that you're always going to be involved in and an important part of life, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess I, I'm also competitive. Even though I try to tell myself I'm not, I always yeah. end up being competitive. Um, <laughs> Sherry, Sherry, my far better half, is is competitive as well. So we have some entertaining moments at our place. You know, even dinner can become a competitive sport. Really? At, I, at I, our I, place. I, can you explain how you do that? Because I'd quite like to take that up as well. Oh, <laughs> just f- f- first one finished wins. Loser does the dishes. Oh, really? <laughs> So indigestion's just like pretty normal then. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> By, byproduct of the, uh, of the win if you can, if you can force it down. Mate, let's talk a little bit about that competitive edge. Where do you think you sort of, where, where did that come from or where does it come from? Um, obviously, parents that were sporty is, yeah. um, is always going to be something that I guess is inherited in one way. I, I can still remember my... My old man sitting there watching the footy and you know yelling at the TV kind of thing. So he was a competitive spectator as well, yeah. and you know I think that drive just to be better than what you were is internally what I've realised as I've gotten older um, is where it comes from. It, it's a, firstly it's about winning as a junior because you don't really understand it's winning or losing. Although these days it's less about that now. It's about competing or, or completing. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I have my own thoughts on that. We'll go, um, we'll go into that later. <laughs> yeah, but I think as you get older and you reflect back, it's it is about being better than last time, yeah. day in and day out. But you know, you don't at fifteen, you just want to win. Whether it's you win your game or you get that you you paddle harder than the bloke next to you, you catch that wave, even if you're just out surfing. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that was something that was in in you from a young age, was it? Yeah, I wasn't like hyperactive competitive. I don't ever recall completely spitting the dummy um, losing, but I do remember tears in losing grand finals at about 11 years old. So yeah, yeah. Um, it's definitely it's definitely been there um, in one form or another, that's for sure. And yeah. you, I think as you get older, you do learn how to channel that competitiveness into a, into a positive energy. Yeah, yeah, mate. I think, I think it's – and that's what I like to sort of understand a little bit about sort of where – what, what people have done growing up because I think it those those traits come into our life later on and and, and they they obviously make us who we are and I mean like you, you said it there like if your dad's screaming at, at, the, at the screen watching watching a match when you were young it's like well what's going on and you maybe you know you start to develop those characteristics as well yeah absolutely it's um but it, it's interesting because 
Sherry's boys are both extremely competitive as well. Um, <laughs> and mum being a, a three-sport national representative and their father also being a, a highly accomplished um, uh, AFL player as well. Yeah. Um, you know, you see it in them too, um, both of them being in uh, competing at national levels at different sports. Um, yeah. Cody's a, a national taekwondo champion wow. and completely, completely self-driven. Like wow. he, he's got this amazing internal drive and I can see where he gets it from. It's, yeah. it's definitely comes from the environment that he's been in. Yeah, Leighton, Leighton, who's the younger, younger, the younger, bigger brother, is um, is also a, a good uh, a good sports person as well. So yeah. yeah, mate, it must be interesting with with your wife Sherry because, as you said there, she, she she's a, a three sport Australian team rep. She's softball, touch football, and triathlon, which is it's it's almost unheard of, like representing Australia at so many different levels. How, how do you guys get on and what's the dynamics of that relationship aside from finishing your dinner first so you don't have to do the dishes? <laughs> oh, it's, it's actually, it's really good. So I grew up sort of being, as I mentioned earlier, the, the 80% guy. I could pick things up reasonably quickly, but I yeah. never excelled to probably the level that I could have or should have if I put any form of effort in, whether that was academic or with sport i could i could just sort of float by and and get it done you know reasonably above average but never be great at anything because of that but um since meeting since meeting her she she sort of just flicked a switch in me and i guess as a she drives me every day to be better but in a good way yeah i see what she does and how she she acts and how she performs and it's just it inspires me every day to to get up and do that and um that that really did change me but yeah. it's great because she, she, she's um, she's there to push you and, you know, when things are going bad, she reminds you. Um, she did beat me in a triathlon in about 2012 and um, it's the only time she has beaten me, but she does <laughs> remind me at least once a month that she's beaten me before. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, it sounds like to be a fly on the wall in that household would be quite interesting, some of the conversations. <laughs> we do have some uh, we do have some entertaining moments with uh we got caught inside a couple of months ago due to some very poor weather and so we decided to to do a bike race on Zwift. Um <laughs> Sherry is a very good cyclist and a far better crit racer than me, but fortunately with Zwift I could get away with it and I did just manage to beat her. Otherwise, yeah, it would have been um <laughs> another couple of years of, of torment of dish of dishes as well <laughs> yeah, yeah absolutely which i probably I, I may or may not have deserved <laughs> <laughs> mate let's move a little bit into sort of the, the present day you're you're more than a well accomplished triathlete now mate and we'll, we'll talk about some of the great things you've done there but tell us about how you sort of got in t- into that whereas soccer was something that was sort of your main sport though you're playing a lot of sports what? How did you move into the world of triathlon? Um, when I moved from the Sunshine Coast up to Bundy, we um, and and that's where I met Cherry. We um, we decided to race. There's an event on the Sunshine Coast. It was actually on last weekend called the King of the Mountain. Right. It's about um, I think it's about four k's with three hundred ele- three hundred meters of elevation in it. You basically run along a road for about fifteen hundred meters, go straight up a mountain basically crawling and straight back down again and back into town. Right. And, and we sort of set a goal to do that. And from there, we, we sort of went, oh, we might do some, some, of, some adventure racing and did some fun adventure races and that sort of thing. And um, did a few running races, some trail running and that sort of thing. Um, we, we managed to, with absolutely no idea what we was doing, get through a, an 86-kilometer charity event, um, like run, walk. Right. And, and a uh, 55k ultra marathon, which was fun. Yeah. But then, but then, like all really good ideas, we were sitting around on an island with some friends at a birthday party one day, and um, we'd had a few beers, to be honest. And <laughs> someone decided it was a really good idea that we should enter a triathlon. Right. And you know, bravado talking at that point, um, agreed completely. Uh, at that point, I didn't own a bike that was suitable to ride on the road. I hadn't been swimming and um, the event was in seven days' time. Wow. wow. So that was, uh, that was an introduction to triathlon. Obviously, I, could, I managed to get myself a bike. Uh, 
managed to swim 50 meters thought yep i can i can do this i'd still been surfing a little bit so i thought you know i'll survive i won't drown yeah and, um, the first race like everybody's first race is interesting got into the water had by what then i thought was a very good swim <laughs> uh, managed to get out and that was good it didn't, didn't stop too much got onto the bike and new beauty of 20k 20k bike ride got stuck into that and Thought I was going like a rock star, but I still couldn't work out how these blokes and girls were so far up the road. Yeah. And then um, got off the bike and started to run, and I'm about a K in, and I'm thinking, this this triathlon thing isn't that hard. I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, by about the 1,500-metre mark, uh, I was wondering how I was going to get to the finish line. So, really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, pacing was a, probably a slight issue. Uh, <laughs> complete lack of understanding on what I was doing was probably another fairly major issue. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh mate it's it's quite funny because i the number of people that i've had on the show that the their journey in endurance starts either when they're having a few beers or when they've woken up the next day having had too many beers is, is quite incredible i remember a few couple of years ago i was interviewing tom evans who that he, he he'd had a few beers with a few of his mates and and and, and made a, a bet in the pub that between them they'd do Marathon de Sable and he went out and did Marathon de Sable and ended up coming third in it and wow. that, that started his ultra running career and I mean he's just finished third in Western States recently as well so it's hilarious when you say you know you sat around having a few beers and then you get into your first triathlon and, and that's it and it's sort of it's almost like the, the spark isn't it? It is well look how Iron Man started. Yeah. It was a bunch of Navy SEALs sitting around having a beer and a bet. Yeah, yeah, as to as to what sport was the hardest, right? Yep. And yeah. look at that now now it's a yeah. some say better or worse, a multi million dollar <laughs> industry which has driven a lot of people to get off the couch too. So Yeah, it's done, it's done a lot. So so you finished your first triathlon, did you? Or did you did you make it through the run? I did. I did <laughs> make it through to the end, thank goodness. Yeah. Um and then sharing her wisdom the next morning entered us into this new local race, um, which was just down the road from home, just a bit out down at Harvey Bay called the Harvey Bay 100. Now the, the race that we'd just done was a, was a sprint distance race. So 750 swim, 20 yeah. K bike, five K run. This new event, which he just entered us into was a two kilometer swim, 80 K bike and 18 <laughs> K run. And it was in six weeks time. No way. So, uh, yeah, it was a very interesting six weeks, and um, it was an even more interesting race that day. So we both survived somehow, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I've got an honour of never missing one so far. So wow. I'm one of five people who have not missed a, one of these Harvey Bay 100 since they began. Wow, wow. So it's what was it then, mate? I mean, you do the first one in seven days after a couple of beers, and then you do... A, a, quite a large race six weeks later what was it that sort of made you go yeah this is this is actually quite a good idea i think it's the challenge again it's that wanting to be better than what you were the day before yeah you go being that typical triathlete a type personality um you look at your results and you go i'm pretty sure i can do this this and this better and <laughs> this is how I'm, this is how i think i should achieve it so you know, we, we went out and, and set some goals and, and tried to chase those. So, you know, it's I, as a coach, I, I would highly not recommend doing it the way we did it, um, going straight from short to long. But, yeah. hey, you know, it's not world-ending. But <laughs> it's, well, mate, it's, um, well, it's worked It's worked pretty well for, for you, mate. You've qualified for five different triathlon world championships twice to Kona. You're getting ready for, for, for Kona this year, mate. I mean, You've really gone from a few beers in the pub with a couple of mates to the top in your age group of, of the sport. I mean, that and, and winning, I mean, you won last year your age group in, in Ironman Taiwan, which is a which is a crazy, a crazy race as well. And 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 and, and you had some interesting circumstances there. So how how have you become so good? That's what I want to know. <laughs> um I've I've made every failure that there is or made every mistake that there is to make right. and I've gone, okay, let's not do that again. Um, I guess the key is to, if, when you do make the mistakes is to learn from them. And, you know, if you're someone with a long, and, and then setting a long-term goal, like the goal, first goal was to try and break five hours in a, um, 
in a half Ironman. And then I said, once I've done that, I'll, I'll sign up for an Ironman, which I did. Right. Um, very first Ironman, I swam like I I didn't believe I could swim breaking. I went about 58 minutes for the swim in New Zealand. So I'm, I was on a huge high and then 10 minutes later, I'm on the side of the road because I've got a flat tyre and clever me didn't check the tube, the length of the valves on the tube. So, oh. um, you know, they're the kind of mistakes that I've made oh. and learned from. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. I'm, I'm the only bloke that, um, that did 182 kilometres on the bike that day because I had to walk back a kilometre to find someone who rang the bike support. Wow. And then they came, fortunately, they came along with a tube and off I went again. Um, <laughs> So it's fair, it's fair to say you've you've learnt the hard way, mate. I have learnt the hard way, um, but I've had some really good people around me. So like I've met people through the sport who are who are fantastic people and are involved in the sport, been involved in the sport a long time, and they've helped and guided me along the way. I've had some some fantastic mentors and coaches to help me, yeah. and right up through to to Dan and Plues, who's currently coaching me. Who's yeah. you know he's world class in in every aspect, both as an athlete as a and as a coach so and and i've i've tested and tried a lot of things and i know what works for me and i know what definitely doesn't work for me so and i think that's a journey that everybody's got to go through if they want to sort of get to the peak of their own personal powers whatever that is um there's different ways to get there there's not a set path for everybody you know yeah this 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 way is not the only way there's there's other ways to get to the same goal so that's a a it's a really interesting topic that mate and maybe we'll talk about it a bit more i mean you you've got a world-class coach we'll go you are a coach as well. well we'll go into that but it seems now people are are looking for solutions without having like you said there you've sort of got to try and test and you've got to learn right but it seems that people people are trying to figure out this solution without going through that process does that make sense yeah absolutely people i think we're in a bit of an age where people want that instant gratification because it's it's in our lives every single day whether it's yeah. in our left hand and our phone or you know, we can we can duck down the road and get whatever we want generally in five minutes, yeah. and um, I think that flows over into a lot of things. I've had people come to me with with realistically unrealistic expectations in what they're trying to achieve in the period of time that they they want to achieve it, and yeah. I've I've in a lot of cases said, look, that's I'm not on board with that. Oh, yeah. I don't. <laughs> I don't agree with what you're doing. You're going to get injured. You're going to get sick. It's, you're going to have a performance at the end of the day that's not going to make you want to come back and do it again. Yeah. Um, some people have agreed with me. Some people have disagreed with me. Such is life. But um, you know, it's you've got to. You, I think you've got to learn, and you need to. Like, if someone came to me tomorrow and said, "How long um, until I'm ready to do an Ironman?" and I've never done a triathlon, I said, "Well, we're, we're going to work your way up." It's you get you, you you know. Learn from the shorter races. Learn from an Olympic distance race. Learn in some longer course races. And when you're comfortable and you've got a good process in place, yeah, then move on to the Ironman and you'll enjoy the experience. Yeah, and, and not be one of these people who does it once and never comes back. And the same happens in in ultra running. Yeah. I know I'm sure you've seen it in what you've done. Yeah, in the um with both CrossFit World and obviously the yeah. endurance stuff that you've done, you've probably seen the same thing. They do it once. They do it on a short fuse and it, they don't enjoy the experience and they never come back to it. Yeah, it's interesting. And it's it's very interesting what you're saying, mate. And it's interesting. I, I like something you said earlier is that you set a goal and you said you have to break the five-hour mark for the 70.3 for a half Ironman before you'll sign up for an Ironman. Whereas a lot of people these days are going, oh, Ironman's the top end of triathlon. I want to sign up for that straight away. That's the big goal. But they haven't almost... They haven't learnt along the way, as you're saying there. And they, they in my opinion, they, it's a rite of passage. You do a sprint distance and you have the right to go on to the next one and then the next one. And you earn the right along the way to, to, to be on the start line of an Ironman. But it doesn't really always work like that, does it? No, it doesn't. And the art of Ironman is it's not what goes wrong because – more than one thing is going to go wrong yeah. and it's how you react to it. And if you haven't faced that um, in a race that's you know half the distance or a quarter of the distance, yeah. how do you react to that when you're 5K is into the bike and you, you've got a flat tyre and you don't have the right spares with you? Yeah. In my case, I, how, <laughs> like, 
the first reaction it was for me was almost I wanted to throw my bike into the paddock because I, but then you you stop for a moment and go okay what's the realistic way out of this situation this is the this is how I saw a person back there a volunteer let's go back to them we'll get them to call so but if you don't have that experience it could be the end of your day yeah. five minutes into five minutes into the ride and yeah. or five days into the ride and 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 you don't want that like there's so many things that can go wrong in in long course racing from you know mechanical issues through to you know just mentally knowing how to deal with the ups and downs of as we, as endurance races know you go through some pretty down <laughs> um and you're wondering how you get to the end and, and you've got to learn a process. I talk to my guys about process. It's all about breaking it down. You don't start the race thinking about the finish line. You start the race in a triathlon thinking about getting to the first boy. Yeah. yeah. Are you a strong swimmer? Are you, are you a mid-pack swimmer? Are you in the right place? Um, are you going to get the shit kicked out of you for the first 500 metres and can you deal with it? Yeah. yeah. Yes or no? And and it break, you break it down like that. But you've got to learn that. Like, Learning that, learning that, and I, man, on the first day. <laughs> yeah, interesting. It's it's very interesting what you're saying there, mate. Because I've, I obviously work with a lot of people as well, and you get people that have the big goals, and and in this scenario, the big goal is 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 Iron Man. Like you want to do an Iron Man, and I get that because people want to do what they think is the biggest and the best and stuff. But that's the big goal and they don't understand those small bits that you're talking about along the way like what did it teach you you know having to walk doing 182k and you know walking back and and getting that help like it taught you so much and has made you such a better athlete right absolutely absolutely i look back at that moment as probably um defining how i could deal with the ups and downs of of ironman um you bet briefly touched on it earlier about um, Iron Man Taiwan last year, and I'm, and I will tell the story because yeah, it's one. I'm go- I was going to hit it, mate, because this is crazy. This story. <laughs> it, it 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 definitely took me to the edge. It tested everything within me, um, and that was before I'd even gotten to the start line. So, um, for those of you who don't know, Iron Man Taiwan is held on the island of uh, Ponghu, which is between Taiwan and China in the China Sea. It's a it's a it's a small chain of islands linked together with bridges. It's um, classed as the windiest place in Asia. They hold a lot of um, uh, windsurfing world championships and that kind of thing there. And right. my goodness, it is windy. I definitely won't argue with them. Um, <laughs> but before the race had even started, a couple of days, we arrived sort of four or five days before and out on the bike, um, I felt that I, I thought my handlebars were loose. I didn't think I must, I thought I must not put them together properly. Um on further inspection, I've noticed that the the integrated aero bar mount on my bike had broken. Now, um, that's a bit of a problem when you've got a 180k race to do, <sighs> and you're in a chi- on an island in the China Sea. Um, there was basically three brands of bike available in in that area, and mine was not one of them. Um, <laughs> that was my first major problem. Um, but prior to that, I was actually supposed to work race in the um, Olympic distance world champs on the Gold Coast. And on the Monday before the race, I just went out for a nice and easy run and managed to strain my calf. Uh, under normal circumstances, I would have walked home and not keep running. But um, due to my crazy life, I had to keep running because this was about 5 a.m. and I had a 6.15 plane to catch. So... Um, definitely not an ideal situation when you're in them five kilometers from home. <laughs> so um, leading into the race, I had done one run uh, in the last six weeks prior to the race, which was the Sunday before the race to wow. see if my car would get through it. Um, I was I was confident-ish <laughs> <laughs> that I would get through at least ten k's of wow. that of that race. So. Uh, here I am rolling up to an Ironman now with a dodgy calf and now I've got a broken bike, which All I couldn't right. ride. Uh, I'd also had a bit of a head cold during the week, so I wasn't in the best frame of mind. And it sort of tested me, okay, how do we find a solution to this? <laughs> I was fortunate <laughs> enough that a, a mate of mine, Damien Collins, who's who's, um, who's a pro triathlete was over there with us and he was sponsored by a company who happened to be over there and they had some bikes one of which they said they'd rent me which i picked up the day before the race wow so i picked up the the bike 
the day before the race, set it up as close as I could to my bike. It was very different um, to in many different ways, just little things that you're so used to using, like where the water bottles are, yeah, where the, whether or not there's a bento box on there and that sort of thing. I then um, I then rode it to the hotel and promptly fell off it in the uh, foyer of the hotel. <laughs> and, uh, I was... I was off for a cracking start on my relationship with my uh, my nice renter bike. So, wow. What? Then I found out the swim was going to be cut short because of the conditions. The conditions were horrendous. Like it was, the swim course was probably not ideal, considering the area that was in. Um, yeah. But it was it was tough. Like I wouldn't swim in it, and I'm a pretty reasonable swimmer. Um, and my race goal, being an Asian race, was a lot of the Asian guys are really strong runners in the heat. They they come at you late in the race as it happened to me at a race earlier in the year in similar conditions. So here I am with no bike, a dodgy calf. And my, one of my strengths was to get away, get away in the swim and then try and hold on for the run. And then they've cut the swim down to about 450 or 500 meters or whatever it ended up being. So oh. I was sitting on the couch at about 1130 AM the day before this Ironman. And I turned to Sherry and I said, I think I'm just going to go to the pub. I've had enough. This is, this is just <laughs> Um, and she just told me to get over it essentially and just go out there and enjoy yourself yeah and i sat there and and i I said okay that's a fair point i'm just i'm just going to go out there and have some fun i've come all this way there's all these other people it's you know i've got a bike i can get through it you know if i have to walk the marathon i'll pull out so be it so uh yeah i guess from there though i I ended up um having a really good race obviously um yeah (laughs) The swim obviously was short, but I, I had a ride which was better than expected on the bike that I was on because at about the 60k mark, because of the slightly different position, um, my hips were tight, my back was sore, my legs were hurting, and I'm like, I don't even think I can make this bloody ride. Um, but then I come good. I, I, I just rode that wave and dealt with it for a while, and I come good. And at about a 100k mark into that ride, I felt strong. Like, I felt really, really strong. Wow. Um, and I, the group that I was with, I ended up riding away from the group of guys. It was about six guys um, that I was with. Um, and it came into transition and there was outside of a, the, the elite rut guys, there was probably three bikes in, in the cow paddock. Wow. Which it was. It was genuinely a cow paddock. It's not your typical, <laughs> definitely not your typical Ironman uh, transition, that's for sure. Yeah, um, right. And then I got out onto the, bar, I got out onto the run and... My legs just felt sensational. You generally know within a couple of k's whether you're going to run well or not. Um, yeah. and I felt really, really good, and I thought, well, that's a good start. The legs are feeling good. Let's see if this calf holds together. Um, fortunately, me for di- fortunately for me, it did. I didn't realise that where I was in the race due to the rolling start, and um, the only people I knew over there were racing, so no one could tell me where I was, what was going on. But I knew I was right up there, yeah. and um, yeah, I ended up running a, a three seventeen marathon off the bike after not r- <sighs> right running five weeks so unbelievable i mean that mate that's it it's an incredible story that really and and but it shows i think it shows one thing mate and 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 i think you've got sherry to thank for that as well like that that phrase of get out there and enjoy yourself like i think that's sometimes lost isn't it we create all these pressures and then it's kind of when everything goes wrong that could go wrong as it, as it pretty much did for you in the prep, like you could either go to the pub or you could just go and try and enjoy yourself. And it seems like that's what you did. Yeah, I, I went out there with the attitude of, of, of having a good old time. And I, yeah. was, I was, I had an absolute ball out there the whole day. Like it was, it was a really interesting course. It was four, uh, four 10K laps and you sort of doubled back on yourself a few times and you were seeing everybody and... And there was um there was a there was, the crowd was out there and and enjoying themselves and I enjoyed it too and then because I was enjoying myself I relaxed and I think that honestly deep down that that helped me get through and yeah. and and go as well as I did like yeah. it was it was not an easy day the wind was just ridiculous there was one section of the bike course on the flat we were doing close to sixty kilometers an hour with a tailwind so wow wow <laughs> it's, uh... But I, th- I think that's a problem with, with a lot, like we create a lot of pressure in ourselves and we're always, and like you say, in, in triathlon, a lot can go wrong. So we're trying to cover off all bases to almost have the perfect race, but you 
you just don't. And then you get too uptight about things that are literally just out of your control. And you forgot, to, you forget to remember that you're actually, this is just, it's a hobby. It's a big part of your life, but it's a hobby. And it's something that you actually started doing for fun. And, you know, and, 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 and when you stop having fun, then it's, you know, if, you, if that attitude's not there, then it stops being fun. But when you go, okay, I'm just going to go out and enjoy myself, then actually things start to click a lot more. Absolutely. Can't, can't agree with you more, um, especially on the hobby part. I think a lot of us get a bit wound up in our, <laughs> in our own self-importance. Of the, and then, you know, at the end of the day, we've got family and friends and work and, and other life things to, to get involved in. Yeah. But, um, it's amazing how many people go into a, a race without any pressure on themselves and just going out there to enjoy them and come away with with, with a great result. I, I, I can honestly say my best results have come from ones where I, I really have just stopped, you know, without lack of a better term, stopped caring yes. about the result. Yeah. Um, but still working on my process. I've I've had the same process for every race for the last three to four years. Nothing's changed. It works. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah. Some days you have good days, some days you have bad days, but when you're relaxed, it's just, it's so much easier. It's yeah. so much more enjoyable. And then when it does get hard, because you're in a good frame of mind anyway, yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, and I guess another sort of uh, observation I've made is if you, if you turn up to a race and the conditions aren't perfect, yeah. like you get windy day, you get rough swim, it's really hot, it's really cold, it's, you know, it's not what you're expecting um, or what the field is expecting, you, you notice that the the faster people don't go fast, the tougher guys go and girls go fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's because just... it, they're not racing at their expectation. They're expecting to go out there and, you know, swim at this pace and they get out of the water and they're 10 minutes slower and they're already into a negative frame of mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, and I think that's like, mate, I'm, I love the data as much as anyone loves, but when there's certain times, especially in races, you sort of have to just – you know, and not only in races, sometimes in your training, you just have to go, okay, this is happening. Who cares if I'm not running the splits I'm supposed to be running or at, at what I'm running? We have to we have to adjust on the go. And I think sometimes we've, we've become a little bit too sort of pre-programmed, haven't we? And we're, we're almost like, yeah, I'm going to do bang, 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 bang. And then yeah, suddenly there's a storm or suddenly something else happens. And we've forgotten, we've forgotten how to adjust to the situation. Yep. Yeah, Absolutely. It, it's um I was listening to you you chat to Boz before she went over to the CrossFit Games. Yeah. And probably the one piece of that interview that stuck in my mind was when she was talking about her running and she was running really well in the cooler conditions and she thought she was on top of it. Yeah. And then she goes, It got hot and I went outside and I felt like I was running in sand. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's just a we all know well, most would understand that that's you know, you're going from reasonably mild conditions into what I'm assuming is fairly top end hot conditions to yeah. say the least over there after yeah. coaching a few people in your area yeah um and that's going to slow you down the effort's still the same the effort's still there like she said at the same heart rate i was running way slower yeah and from a coaching point of view that's why i always try and use with all of our guys and girls we try and use two metrics on everything right because you know um biggest the best place to witness why one metric doesn't work is watching a lot of people ride just a power in hawaii you 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 see a lot of people blow up at the back end of the bike ride and a lot of people walking because they go out there and ride the power and forget the fact they've come from you know 10 or 15 degree days into 32 33 humid days yeah and haven't yeah. allowed for the physiological response of just that increased heart rate due to the heat yeah um, i think we're quite fortunate that we we go the other way i mean i mean obviously running in the, in the heat in dubai through through the summer and the paces that i'm able to keep here now in australia i'm i, I look down at my watch i'm like oh the what watch isn't working i can't be going that fast i've been you know i've been running in dubai and it's 35 40 degrees and i'm struggling and then here i'm like oh no no it's 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 not really four and a half minutes okay that it must be wrong uh, so I sort of get it the other way around it's so it's so true and it's um oh i bet i bet you loved it though Oh, mate, yeah, it's, uh, but that's what I say to, I mean, mate, we, we have something, I mean, we have it similar, like, you know, people going into summer in Dubai and through winter, you know, certain effort, certain heart rate, they've been able to hit a certain pace across or certain power numbers. And then as the summer comes, like, 
you know, everyone in training peaks, everyone is like, oh, I'm not hitting my numbers. And like, yeah, mate, it's, uh, it's 10 degrees hotter. It's all good. You know? <laughs> <laughs> mate, let's talk a little bit about, about your coaching because you, you, you've coached a lot. You're coaching now. What, tell, us, tell us about what, what you do and, and how you do it. Yeah, so I got into coaching when I was playing soccer at about 14 years old um, is when I coached my first team and I'm going to use that term extremely loosely because at 14 you don't know anything uh, you really don't you know even less than what you think you know and I guess every teenager knows everything so you know Obviously, yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I really enjoyed de- developing those kids like I was a kid but these were little kids they were like five and six years old it's it's like six aside outdoor soccer which we called brew ball over here yeah um, and it's just about getting people engaged in the sport um and we sort of stayed, there was me and my best mate, we sort of stayed with this team right the way through till about they were 15, um, which and we were lucky enough to, to win a grand final with them. So that was a really, really good experience uh, around learning how to develop people or, or young kids and um, what works and what doesn't. Um, you know, you look back now and you go, geez, I could do it pretty much everything differently but yeah. it was a good grounding and a good experience and I've always been in, involved in some developing people in some form or another even even through work right. uh, I had apprentices work excuse me working for me and you know it's the same thing you're helping develop them and you you work you learn how people work better in some situations than others and how they learn or and how they um and how how to develop them like you know people learn better some I'm I'm a kinesthetic learner. I learn by doing. Yeah. Um, but other people prefer to be spoken to. Other people prefer to be shown. And most people are just a bit of a combination. In learning those little tricks of the trade, you know, move move along down the line. Um, how I got into sort of endurance sports coaching was, I just had people asking me about triathlon and how I did this and how I did that. Yeah. Um, Sherry and I, well, Sherry more than me, started um, a, a running. This is well before Park Run ever existed over here or right. ever existed at all, or the Bundy Road Runners. And every week we do a timed run. Um, just it, It's just a gold coin donation. It's all about getting people moving. Yeah, and, nice. you know, what we did is we took that into a little – people wanted to run faster, so we started to do track sessions and we started to do this and that. And then I sort of went, okay, how do we – how do I formalize this? So I went through the Triathlon Australia coaching program um, and went through went through that and learnt. Um, tried different styles and different ways of coaching, and I found I always came back to the same thing. I, I, I'm de- I like the data driven approach. I think what you can measure, you can change or you can improve on. It's as the old yeah. saying goes. Yeah. And um, I, I really enjoy it. At the end of the day, um, having that approach. At the moment. Um, due to work and study and all those things, as you called it, my, my superpower earlier, uh, travel. <laughs> yeah. um, I, um, I, I take on no more than five personalised coach athletes at a time because I want wow. to give them an experience that they deserve and my full attention. Wow. Uh, and, and I think we get the results from that. It's, it's, it's a science-based approach. We do... Um, it, we, every session generally has a target of some description, whether it's to slow you down or to speed you up. <laughs> um, slowing people down is generally harder than making them speed up. I know. That's why I'm laughing, mate. <laughs> I thought you might be. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly why. It's funny because, I mean, we talk and, and half of the listeners are going to be going, what are they talking about? But more and more, we're talking about slowing people down and slowing them down to speed them up later. So when you come up with that, then it's like, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Brilliant. My favourite line to people is, "We don't. You don't need to be fast today. You need to be fast on the day that you're racing. That's the only day that counts." Yeah. So right now, yep. I know you can run a 20-minute 5k, but your aerobic fitness says that if you're going to go and run for two hours, your 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 pace is probably going to be about six-minute pace. Yeah, yeah. It's um, yeah. It's in. It, it is interesting, mate, because like you said, you're very data-driven. We're also very data-driven. But it's actually really getting a decent understanding for those numbers, and and it's it's also very cool what you said, just working with a few clients so that you can be hands-on, so that you can almost move with that data through the relationship and and through their through their progression and their experience within the sport as well. I think that's super important. 
Absolutely. Um, like I do do sort of just more general programs for people or someone will come and go, hey, can you write me a 12-week program? I go, yeah, no problems. But yeah. um, you generally don't get that that result um, that you do when you're able to, to look at people's information every day or every couple of days and, and review it at the end of the week, have a conversation with them and then progress the next week. Yeah. I've had guys where we've progressed sessions and then we've got guys where we're repeating sessions until they until they nail it. and. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's the key. There's no point overloading them and overloading and overloading them if they don't get that first session right. You especially, you know. So I have a I have a perfect example of an athlete who's who's a very strong aerobically but has a very small or, or, or low tolerance to top end work, VO2 max and lactate threshold work. So we 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 had to gradually build him up to that. Yeah. yeah. To that ability, like it started with 30 second hard efforts on the bike. Um, yeah. And that's that's. When you're not when you're not hands on with them, you don't you don't see that. You just hand the piece of paper over and get off you go, mate. Yeah, and, and it just it doesn't work. I think that's it. I think that's a big learning for people that do work with coaches that are listening and or, or looking for coaches. These are the kind of things that set good coaches apart from not so good coaches let's call them that or crap ones um you know the fact Inst- instagram that, coaches yeah instagram coaches and there's there's a whole lot of those around you know the, the ability to be a little bit sciencey but then put it into normal jargon and actually take someone through that experience because like you say you can write someone a 12-week program for something but the real experience is going to be finding out yeah what's your tolerance like at certain levels of intensity and certain levels of stress and 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 you can't do that by just dishing up a a simple you know here's your program for the next 12 weeks and that's it you've got to you've got to work with them closely right absolutely and and everybody's got a load tolerance um and at everybody's different um i know i've heard you speak many times about using HRV yep. tracking, and we use that with our guys and girls. And so we can tell we've got a pretty good gauge on, on in training peaks terms, what the, what their weekly training stress score is, yep. and where their limit is at their current fitness. So you know when we get we see a negative response, we go, okay, that's your current load limit, yep. and we work around that depending on whether they're training for an Ironman or a half Ironman or, or ultra marathon or whatever it is that they're aiming for. But everybody's got a limit, and you know. Some days you can feel fantastic or some days you can feel terrible, but you're physiologically you're the complete opposite. Yeah. And understanding that limit for people is, is, is so, so important. It prevents burnout. I, I think I got a really good compliment and I was sort of really pleased when one of my athletes said to me the other day, he goes, I've been working with you for about nine weeks now. He goes, I haven't been sore. I haven't raced for two years. I haven't trained for two years and I'm still better than I've ever been after training for four or five years. Wow. So that's... because we manage his load. So we, we manage his load. We know what he's capable of yep. and away he goes. He, yeah. he can get up tomorrow and do it and he can get up tomorrow and do it because endurance sports is consistency. That's the, the, a key piece of it. If you can't get up tomorrow and, and do the next session and get up tomorrow and the day after and do that session and that one and that one and that one, yeah. um, you're never going to have success in long endurance like extreme endurance and endurance events you know half ironman marathons ultra marathons cycling etc yeah very true mate very true mate i want to go back to one of the things i mentioned at the start and one of the biggest excuses that we see in endurance sport talking about progress or lack of progress is that people will often say and it is a time consuming i was talking about it on a run this morning you know if you're going to train for iron man you could be training up to 20 hours a week but mate you have a superpower which is the ability <laughs> to train and compete and you are at the highest level mate we could we could have actually taught the whole show about the fact about your kona like you've raced at kona 2017 you're going in 2019 you've you've raced at the highest level but you still work full time and a stat that you sent over to me is blown my mind you flew you took over 250 flights in 18 months you study and you spend time with sherry as well mate (laughs) that is a superpower give us a little bit of chat about that i'm massively (laughs) impressed i thought i did a lot i mean mate it's ridiculous and and i never sacrifice sleep that's the the key piece to to doing or to 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 being able to do what i do is i know how much sleep i need and if i wake up 
if I've had a bad night's sleep, I will can or modify my training session for that morning or that day. That's that is the centerpiece of, of my my training is that the sleep is the key piece uh, yeah. of everything. Um, yes, so yeah, I did. I have taken over two hundred and fifty flights. Um, last week I flew six times in three days. Um, I travelled. God, I couldn't even tell you how many kilometres. And by the end of the week, I'd racked up nineteen and a half hours of training. I'd slept in six. I think it was six different beds in six nights. Um, so. The, the key pieces are is and I trust me I don't I'm not able to follow this every day but is to try and eat and hydrate well every yeah. single day. Yeah. I end up in places in outback Queensland where if you're really lucky the pie won't walk itself to the car and it's the only thing left in the whole place to eat. <laughs> um, so so when I can eat well I do I do have I do have bad days I, yeah. I'm I, I have tendencies to binge on things which is. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those one of those things that I have to learn learn or I learn to control some days and I don't other days. But yeah. eating and hydrating well is is probably the first piece of that puzzle after sleeping. And then time management. Yep. One is speak if you have a coach, talk to your coach and understand or get them to understand how much time you have in a day, morning and night. How much sleep do you need? How much time do you need with your family? How much time do you need to get your work done and how much time have you got left over for training? I know I've heard you speak about this many, many times and many other coaches, the same deal. People get their ambitions and their capabilities completely mixed up in this place yeah. constantly and it has a negative effect because as I had one guy ring me the other day and he goes, I don't want to miss this session. I said, why? I said, it's one session in three months. I said, it's not going to hurt and yeah. you've got a commitment that you can't get out of. He goes, oh, but I feel guilty. I said, yeah, I know. I know exactly how you feel. <laughs> I said, I totally understand. And But we spoke through it. And he goes, hey, fair point. He goes, I said, if you can do something, do something. If you can't, just let it go. One session's not going to hurt. Yes. Yeah. But being being organized, so because of my travel, I'm, um, I'm fairly um, – I, I, I know exactly where every pool is. In Queensland, I know what time they open. I know where almost every running, anywhere I can run, every gym, I plan really, really well each yeah. week. Um, as I said to someone yesterday, Dan, my coach, must put my week in and then look at it on the Sunday and go, that looked nothing like the week that I put in there. <laughs> because I, as we, he knows, I move things around to fit into my yep. travel schedule. Yeah, which um, is what you have to do, right? Exactly. Uh, I guess in my situation, he's pretty liberal with me because he knows I know that, you know, doing back to back to back yeah. threshold sessions is not going to work. Yeah. So uh, I have, uh, I, I'm, I'm aware to that. I did try that a couple of times. It doesn't end well. No, no it's disaster. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess the key pieces are plan ahead, understand what you can actually fit into your life, or if you like me, travel, work, study. My, I'm lucky. I make my study time becomes flight time. So when I'm flying, yeah, everything is downloaded. I can I can watch my lectures and do my study whilst I'm flying. So, you know, that's that's combining two things. One, I can I can sit there and watch a movie, or when classes are on, I can do one of my classes, just yeah. like a normal person. Yeah. I then get off the plane, I go to work, and I come home from work or back to the motel room, and off I go. It's running, it's swimming, it's riding. It's sometimes it's. Hotel, hotel gymnastics or hotel strength training. I mean, yeah. you know, you've just got to have the ability to adapt and mould. And, and as Sherry said to me years ago, just get over it and do something yeah. and get it done. How can I help? Yeah, yeah I think that's the – I mean, mate, that, that's the thing. And, like, you figured it out and you, f you find a way. And what do they say? If you, you either find a way or you find an excuse. But, mate, to – to do what you're doing and, and to do it at the level you're doing, massive respect, mate. It's um yeah, that's phenomenal. So Yeah, thank you. It's um uh, you do have to turn things down. You have to make that decision. You know, when you're travelling with work colleagues, they want to go and sit in a pub and have a beer. I'm like, mate, I'm going to the pool. Yeah. 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 You, I mean, and that's the thing, it's it's the it's the willpower and it's the it's the discipline, isn't it, to 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 do that. Because of course it's easier after a long day and you've started an early flight in the morning, you've worked hard all day, it's much easier to go and and, and, and sit around. But you've got goals and you, you've got a, you've got the energy. If you've got the energy to sit in a pub drinking a beer, you've, you've got the energy to go for a run or a swim. I always think. 
Yeah, absolutely. It, and it comes down to how bad do you actually want whatever your goal is, whether yeah. it's your short-term goal or your long-term goal. How bad do you really, really want it? Yeah. That's if you if if it's if it's if a pub going to the have a beer at the pub is more important than going to your session, then obviously it's not as important. Yeah. Your goal is not as important as you think it is to you because deep down you'll know. Yeah, absolutely. Mate, we I don't want to take too much more of your time, mate, but honestly, incredible, incredible uh, advice you've given, mate. And as I said there, guys, this guy, Kep, knows a few things. He's been to Kona, mate. You're going back to Kona. We could, as I said, we could talk all about Kona. I mean, it's just... Is phenomenal what you've done, mate. But I just want to ask you one last question, which is a bit of a... You might be prepared because you've listened to a couple of our podcasts. What we finish up with, mate, is you have to wrap up all of your advice into one piece of advice. Everything you've learned along the way, what's the best piece of advice that you can dish up to people? I think if it means something to you, you'll find a way. There we go. That's that's pretty much it. Um, if you want something bad enough, whether it's work, for health and fitness, life in general, if you want something bad enough, you'll find a way to achieve it. Agreed. Mate, absolutely brilliant. We don't need to talk anymore. That is so good, mate. And honestly, we appreciate the time. You're, you're a busy man. I'm going to put links in the show notes to over to your Instagram and, and where people can, can get a hold of you, see what you're doing, follow your journey to Kona for those that are interested and Mate, maybe you might have inspired a couple of people to contact you and get on that waiting list to be one of the chosen five to be coached by you as well, mate. <laughs> oh, hopefully, mate. Hopefully, and um, you keep you and your team. You guys do such fantastic work. I love, love, um, love the way you engage with your community and in what you do with your guys and girls. So, Thanks, mate. Uh, yeah. keep keep that up. It's uh, it's inspiring. Uh, it's, it's... We use it every day. Thank you, mate. Thanks a lot. Listen, I'll let, I'll let you crack on, Cap, but we, we really appreciate it, mate. And uh, we'll, we'll definitely be watching you at Kona this year and some absolutely brilliant advice in, in that show. So thanks a lot. Thanks, mate. Really yeah. appreciate it. Cheers.